Yes, uh, it is a pleasure to uh, be here again this week. This is our second uh, webinar in our series, Diversity Now. Uh, today's webinar is entitled um, Schooling During a Crisis, Steps for Successful Hybrid Learning Environments. And uh, we are so fortunate to have Dr. Michael Barbour um, with us today, who is an Associate Professor of Instructional Design at, uh, in the College of Education and Health Sciences at Toro University. Uh, as you all will see here in a, in a little bit, Dr. Barber is an expert when it comes to K through 12 distance online and blended learning, having uh, been involved in it for over two decades as a researcher, evaluator, teacher, course designer, and administrator. Uh, his research has focused on the effective design, delivery, and support of K through 12 distance online and blended learning which is extremely valuable for us in this moment in time where uh, I would say greater than 50% of, of our schools across uh, the nation, but definitely here in the state and where we are, are online. And so uh, this, this is going to be a great conversation where we are going to be able to learn a lot and hopefully get some practical tools about how we can uh, maximize the impact of uh, our current state of affairs in education. Uh, Louise, would you like to, to say a few words before we get started? I would love to. Um, thank you, Ijoma, for that offer, because Michael also has just become our go-to person. So we've always had the benefit of Michael's support in the Graduate School of Education, and he quickly became campus support and even uh, system-wide with the Toro, Calif Toro College and University System, which um, has multiple campuses across the U.S. and globally. Uh, his knowledge of instructional design and um, distance learning are by far one of the, uh, in fact, every time we, a lot of us will run into people citing authors and they are citing Dr. Michael Barber. And we're like, oh, we know him. <laughs> He's ours. So, uh, so I do want to just, um, just say those few words that you are in great hands today because there will be, I'm sure, from Michael, I always find pearls where I'm like, oh, even for a stretch learning, because I feel like I'm sometimes I'm like, oh, I know all these things. And then Michael will say, and what about this? And I'll get that stretch learning piece that will push me a little bit further to think more about my instructional practices, especially now that we're remote. Um, so looking forward to this session. And uh, Michael, I think it's all you now. Sure. Uh, great. Well, thank you, Louise and uh, Ijeoma. Um, I want to start basically with a quick uh, sort of introduction and a few comments. And um, these seminars or these webinars that we've set up with the, the Diversity Now series are mainly designed to be a, um, a conversation. So knowing that a lot of folks may be, particularly all the, the TU faculty and staff that have to leave at four o'clock. Uh, what I'd encourage you to do is if you do have questions, post them in either the chat or into the, uh, there's a question and answer feature that you'll see on your bar at the bottom. Um, additionally, when you are using the chat, you will notice right above where it says type message here, there is a little pull down and the options you'll see there are all panelists or all panelists and attendees. If you want to ask a question of myself or, or Ijeoma or Louise, uh, and you don't want others to see it, just select all panelists. If you would like to make a comment about things we're talking about, um, essentially the, the virtual version of, I guess, passing notes during a session, uh, make sure you pick all panelists and attendees so that way uh, all of the attendees in the room can see. Um, so as uh, Louise and uh, Ijeoma mentioned, uh, I'm Michael Barber, I'm an associate professor here, and um, I first got involved in, in distance learning at the K-12 level because I'm originally from Newfoundland, Canada, and that's one of the things I, I like to tell people up front for a number of reasons. Uh, first, because, well, I'm Canadian and we're very proud of that, you know, my Tim Hortons mug here, which is a, a Canadian institution. Um, and if you don't know what Tim Hortons is, shame on you. Although they don't have any in California, which is my biggest regret. I've got to drive like 1,100 kilometers to get to one. Um, 
but uh, so Newfoundland is a province that is roughly the size of California. The difference between California and Newfoundland, or I guess one of the differences, um, other than the fact that we're cold and in the middle of the North Atlantic, is the fact that while we're the size of California, we only have half a million people living in the province. And about 65% of those people live within an hour's drive of the capital. So what that means is we've got, an, we're an island in the North Atlantic, so we've got all these little communities all around the exterior of the island because you know, we were a fishing nation for many, many generations. Um, for us, from an educational perspective, that means that of the approximately 400 schools that are in the province, 50% um, of them have less than 200 kids. 25% of them have less than 100 kids in them. And I'm not talking like, you know, like a, a K through three or, uh, you know, a high school. I'm talking like an all grade school. Uh, a third of our schools are necessarily existing, which means that they are so far from anything else, in some cases, not reachable through any normal means, um, that they can't be closed. Uh, so we have um, schools throughout the province that, you know, are K through 12, which you would think is 13 grades, but there might only be six students in there or eight students in there. Um, we have schools in the province that are only available by boat. Um, so, you know, there's a ferry that sort of pops along the way because there are no roads going to those schools. And being in the North Atlantic, as you might imagine, the ferry service is not all that reliable at the best of times as well. So distance education has been a fact of life for us in the province uh, for many, uh, many years, really since the early 1980s. And for myself, I was fortunate that I grew up in the other urban center in Newfoundland. So not the capital, but the other city that existed. And when I say city, I mean 26,000 people because by Canadian standards, you need 25,000 to be considered a city. I graduated from the third largest high school in the province. We had 857 students. Um, for reference, the largest had about a thousand, and I think it was 1,046. Um, you know, my school was a large, considered a large urban school, so we had a full selection of curriculum. We had AP courses, um, and then I went and eventually became a teacher. Six years later, I'm teaching in what's still the 19th largest school in the province, 647 kids. And there's no AP courses. The selection of curriculum is pretty good, but not what I had in my own high school. And, um, you know, I was a social studies teacher. Um, we had an online a web based at the time, um, math and science AP program. So being a social studies guy, I thought, well, this is not right. You know, I've got to do something about this. So we created an online program. And one of the reasons why we included this topic as part of this series, um, you know, is because the idea of trying to provide opportunity for students that wouldn't normally have it is really an accessibility issue. And when you look at so many issues surrounding diversity, at the root of a lot of it is the ability to access certain things. Um, you know, the ability to access quality education. As we learned last week, you know, the ability to access an education system where you can see within both the teachers and the leaders yourself. Um, for, you know, a lot of our African American males that we have, for those of you who were with us last week. Um, you know, these are all, you know, social justice and accessibility issues because, um, you know, so when we look at what's happening now um, with the move to remote learning that we had both in the spring and what's starting to come about now in the fall is there are certain populations of students just by virtue of the fact of where they live, what they have access to, and, and particularly here in the U.S., because education is locally funded so much, you know, the services that are going to be provided to them are going to be very different than folks that might only live, you know, a dozen miles away from them in a, in a different district or in a different county. Um, you know, and as you're looking at what's happening uh, here we're sort of a, a little bit behind the, 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 the eight ball, if you will. Um, you may have noticed in the uh, media in the last little bit 
Um, some of the jurisdictions throughout the country have already started to open up. And one that scrolled through my uh, Twitter feed earlier this week um, was, oops, let me see, where's my share to this particular picture. And this was school on Tuesday at Paulding High School. I guess it's Paulding High School. It's a high school in Paulding County, Georgia. And this is actually just before lunch on Tuesday. And I mean, as you can see, well, first I'll say that Georgia is a, a state that doesn't have a statewide mask requirement, but this is their version of a safe, socially distant school environment in a pandemic. And, um, you know, I mean, you can see there's a couple of folks there with masks, but obviously the vast majority appear not to have them. Um, you don't have your six feet of, of distance, or as us Canadians would say, one hockey stick of distance uh, that's, you know, available between the kids. And, you know, while so many of our schools here in California are looking at potentially moving to a remote setting first, uh, a lot of them are still trying to figure out how do they provide that in-person learning. Um, you know, if you had a chance to review the state of California's guidance that they put out in June on this. Um, one of the models that they specifically talked about in here was having, you know, half of the students show up on Mondays and Wednesdays, the other half show up on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And for the other 60% of the time, they would be learning online or in some remote fashion. You know, even if you think back to the picture you just looked at and you remove just half of the students from that picture, that's still a hell of a lot of students in a very small space that you've got there. So, um, you know, these are some of the issues I think that we need to think through. And unfortunately, you know, if you have had the chance to review this, one of the things that you note is that, you know, it's a 55 page document, but once you get into the meat of it, it's actually 40 pages of stuff. And the vast majority of it is questions. You know, as you begin your school year, here's all the things that you need to sort of figure out uh, from, you know, special needs students to uh, how you provide career and technical education, English language learners to uh, what instructional programs and scheduling. And it's all of these questions. It's a useful document for school leaders in terms of trying to think through what is happening, um, but not a lot of advice on, you know, here's what you should do. And that's really where school leaders are left now, you know, and my guess is, is that the vast majority of school principals and district leaders could have probably guessed 90% of the questions that's in here. And, um, you know, so just get, telling them the things that they need to be worried about is, is not guidance, if you will. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we, another one of the reasons why we wanted to put this together now, because here, at least in the, the Bay Area, most of our schools are going to be opening up in the next week and a half to two weeks. Um, so now is, if folks haven't started doing things at this stage, now is really the time to start to, to work on them. So at that point, I'll, I'll pause because I know... Um, um, my two colleagues here may have some questions to get us going. I haven't seen any in the uh, chat other than just asking about the uh, picture. And yes, it was from Tuesday. Ooh, perfect. Uh, we do have one here now. Uh, so Brenda, and I know Brenda is uh, one of our TU people, so I'll get to that question first just because she may have to run off to the, the provost's uh, town hall. Um, how do we demonstrate that the idea is a false belief? And um, the idea I'm trying to remember here, how do we, have, how do we have effective classes? Right. There's just that difference in, from state to yep. state here in Bay area, from city to city and County to County about um, is, uh, is COVID-19 real? Is this pandemic real? Why do we need to have safe schools? We have Vacaville Christian school that just announced that they're opening fully uh, in person next week, and they're so glad to show that enrollment is increasing for their school because there are a lot of parents who are like, ah, oh, finally a school that believes the way I believe, I'm going to send my kids there, even if I have to pay tuition, right? 
And that's actually been a common tact of a lot of the, um, not just private schools, but you're seeing more and more charter schools that aren't beholden to, um, you know, a, a school district that are taking that. Although here in California, because uh, the nature of our charter school legislation, uh, they still have to follow the governor's mandate with a lot of the things. So Brenda's question basically was looking at the idea that in many cases we see that brick and mortar instruction or face-to-face -face instruction is believed to be effective, whereas distance or remote learning is believed to be less effective uh, than face-to-face -face learning. If I'm getting the grasp of your question there, Brenda, and um, that's a question we often get, and it's actually interesting because the research has actually shown that in most cases, online learning, when it is designed for a specific population of students, tends to be more effective than actually face-to-face -face learning. Um, now, I don't attribute that to the medium that it's in. Um, in fact, within the field of, of educational technology in general, there's a, a sort of an infamous line that was published back in the 1980s that uh, was summarizing research from the previous 40 years. Uh, where a guy by the actually he's a faculty member down in Southern California by the name of Richard Clark basically says that technology impacts uh, learning the same way the delivery truck impacts the nutritional value of the groceries that it carries. In both cases, they're just a delivery medium and it's essentially how those things are transported, not the medium in which it's transported that actually has an impact upon the quality. Um, and one of the things that we see with online learning is that so often it can target specific populations. So there are programs out there that are designated for at-risk students or designated for accelerated or AP students. And that allows those programs to have an instructional model and a specific course design that will cater to the, the needs and the characteristics of those learners. But so oftentimes in the classroom, you know, even in streamed sort of classrooms, and I know most classrooms aren't officially streamed, but the nature of the curriculum often means that they're unofficially streamed. You've got a wide range of learners. And as a teacher with 35 kids in front of me, I can't tailor my instruction to one group of students over another. I've got to try to be all things to all people. And because of that, it tends to be much less effective than what a lot of these online programs can be. Um, now, one of the things you'll often see in the media is a lot of these studies that find that cyber charter schools tend to be quite ineffective. And that is true. And the reason that's true is the same reason that a lot of face-to-face -face learning is not true, is, is ineffective, sorry. Um, it's because they have a single model of design and delivery, and it's often based on a cost model, the, what's the most cost efficient, because most of these programs tend to be run by for-profit corporations. And that one size fits all model just doesn't accommodate all of these different learners that are out there. Um, uh, Ashanti asks, uh, right. sorry, go ahead, Ijeoma. You mind if I just jump in there real quick? You go right ahead. So uh, one of the things that I, I like the, the question that Brenda uh, brings up, but I think there's a big assumption there when uh, she says that she thinks that families in Georgia uh, feel that their kids are going to be, get a better education in a brick and mortar environment. And the reason why I say that is because in, in, in my work here in the community of Sacramento, one of the things that I have, have found is how disruptive distance learning has been to the economy of the family, right? Uh, where families are struggling with how do we manage the care of our children during the day, along with, I don't have the luxury of having a job where I can work from home. I actually have to go to work, right? And so I think there are a lot of families that are looking to put their children back into a traditional model of schooling simply so they can go to work every day and not have to make decisions about is a parent going to stay home while one goes to work or you know those those types of considerations and i think that's when we talk about schooling in a virtual environment i think that's really important that we understand that a part of schooling is a child care necessity for a lot of families that work a traditional eight to five type job you mind speaking to that a little bit michael 
actually, I'm glad you brought that up because that is actually one of the concrete suggestions I always give to school leaders when they ask me about this particular topic, because not only do we have a lot of, of, of students, you know, who have, you know, essential workers as parents, so they don't have the luxury of staying home, or they don't have the necessary technology at home bandwidth or devices. And, you know, depending upon the district, they may or may not be able to get that out. So the home environment is just not a suitable environment for them to be. There's no reason why, and, and in all honesty, I think that it's incumbent upon school leaders to start identifying what are some of the challenges that parents are going to have to face, even if we're in some kind of hybrid model. You know, because there are some parents that can stay home. There are some parents that can't. Who are the parents that can't? Where are they located? Um, you know, are they able, is it, you know, are they out of the school, you know, out of the home, sorry, like Monday through Friday? Or is it like three days a week or five days a week? How can we get some of these parents getting together to collaborate with, uh, you know, each other so that if, you know, they're one of them's home one day a week, one of them's home two days a week, you know, that kind of thing. How can we start to build these little pods, if you will? And I think that it, the onus is up on the school. This is not something the parent should have to do. The only thing the parent should have to do is fill out a little survey that says, here are the things that I need. And then the school helps coordinate these kinds of things. And that might not necessarily be in other people's homes. You know, that might be looking at what's available in the community. You know, there are a lot of community resources that are available. Um, you know, one of the things that we uh, can look at is it's not that we can't bring people together. It's we can't bring people together in tight, confined spaces when there's a lot of folks there. You know, if, if I've got a regular size, you know, meeting slash classroom at a community center that I could easily fit, say, five students in. There's no reason why we can't use that as a space for five parents that are essential workers that just can't leave their kids at home, you know, and coordinate these kind of things. So one of the things school leaders should be doing right now, because we're only a week and a half away from school starting, is communicating with the, you know, their parents and guardians of their students and finding out who has an inability to access quality education under their current context because in all honesty if they don't i mean in my opinion and i'm not a legal scholar by any means and but you know one of the things that we do have in the united states that is fairly well grounded within litigation is fape you know free access to public education and if you're creating an instructional model that disenfranchises a whole class of students to me you're denying them their fate right and to me that's you know especially when you're doing it, you know, over a, a wide span of students that can easily be identified by certain demographics, you know, to me, that's a, a, a court case waiting to happen, you know, so any school leader out there should be looking at, you know, how can I help coordinate these kinds of things. The other thing that we don't think about when we talk about these hybrid models is, you know, while I don't have children, I'm a remote worker, you know, I'm a university faculty member. I work from this room, like, uh, unless I'm at my kitchen table, this is where I am during the day. If I did have children, why do I need to send them to the school building? I have the ability for them to be here. I've got a high speed internet. I've got a half a dozen computers sitting in my home or devices. You know, there's nothing that would prevent my student from being here 100% of the time. And if my student can be here 100% of the time, that means someone else's child could be in the school building 100% of the time. You know, so this idea that, you know, we have to make everything equal for folks so that if one student is in the, the school two days a week and at home three days a week, then every student has to look like that. And that's something else that I haven't seen a lot of school leaders start to, you know, explore as they're looking at these different models. You know, there are some people that do have the ability to uh, be a little bit more accommodating during this time period. And as a community, you know, the, the school leaders should be trying to figure out who those people are, if they're willing to undertake that, and then what kind of flexibility does that buy me on the other side? Um, the other that. thing that's part of your question is the idea of, you know, a lot of those parents that would be, you know, essential workers in many classes are working in low income 
you know, low paying jobs. I mean, they're, they're working at our grocery stores and in our restaurants and stuff like that. And, and a lot of those are the same families that don't have access to technology, don't have access to high quality, um, um, you know, internet access and broadband and that kind of thing. And implicit in Brenda's question, and I'm glad she used the term remote learning, um, because one of the things that the countries that have, or the jurisdictions, I should say, because it's not always countries, the jurisdictions that have done the best in the spring when we were all just sort of scrambling were the folks that still had strong legacy distance education programs. And by legacy, I mean ones that use tools other than the internet. I look at a jurisdiction like New Zealand, where you know they have a very strong correspondence program that has been in place since the 1920s that covered off most of the upper, uh, what we would call middle school and high school, but for them it would be roughly years seven and eight or higher. Um, you know, so folks that didn't have access to the internet still had access to these high quality materials. Uh, the public broadcaster in New Zealand actually would give up all of their daytime programming to the uh, education system so that you knew that if I had a, you know, a child in grade two, that at one o'clock, that was going to be their hour to watch TV because that's when the curriculum, you know, that's when the programming would be focused upon my grade two outcomes. And there were a lot of places here in the U.S. that did this. You know, if you look at Shelby County in, in Memphis, um, all three of their local stations, the NBC affiliate, the uh, CBS affiliate, and the ABC affiliate, all did instructional type programming throughout the day that focused upon different grade levels. Um, Nebraska, which still their online high school has actually evolved from their correspondence program. So they still have, you know, stacks of these instructional packets that were available that were the starting point for all of the online materials that they've got. So they were able to provide a, a continuity of learning for their students much better than many of the urban jurisdictions that, you know, we're looking at. Um, you know, and that's something else that, that school leaders need to be looking at because there are a lot of these programs out there available and a lot of these partnerships to be had with our local partners that we really didn't explore in the spring that need to be looked at now if they haven't been already. Michael, uh, I, wanna, I wanna pick up on Ashanti's question, uh, but I wanna add something, some, some additional context to that question. Uh, one, one would be, uh, I, I, I used to work in Arizona and one of the things that I learned when I worked in Arizona is that Arizona uh, is different from California. And I know that that kind of seems obvious, right? But, but culturally, it was, a, it was a culture shock for me, right? The, the things that were, were, especially as a scholar, right? The, the literature that was so common to me that I can go to any university uh, in the area and folks would understand the different scholars that I was talking about, different literature, that stuff was, some of the, those readings were foreign, right? Uh, so the, their belief systems, their culture, et cetera, et cetera. You talked about how schools in this time have to be responsive to communities. And, and it dawned on me looking at Ashanti's question that some communities may not feel that the virus is, um, I don't want to say real, but is not is having the impact that, that we feel is having here in California. The other question, I, the other part of that I would add to that is, you know, the American Association of, of uh, Pediatricians came out a couple months back and, and noted that they are seeing an increase in suicide ideation, an increase in mental health issues, an increase in isolation, right? And so an uh, increase in, in abuse, right? And so some communities may feel like, hey, it's, it's less safe for my kid to be at home than, it, than at school. So how do we as school leaders reconcile this idea of safe and safety when we have, a, we could potentially be working in a community that have very different sentiments than our own. Well, a couple of things to, to unpack there. First, from a responsible public health perspective, in all honesty, 
other than trying to educate the parents as to, you know, realistic expectations about what this threat poses and how it's going to change our lives, not just in the short term, but in the long term. Um, you know, something that uh, not necessarily school leaders, but I think is the onus is up on district leaders and really state and elected officials, but they seem to be dropping the ball on this um, in a big way. And if they still refuse to believe, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is that you, you know, you still have to, to push forward. You know, I mean, there's some people that you're just not going to change their mind. And the reality is, is we can't adjust what we are doing from a safety perspective to accommodate someone who's just, you know, hard headed and refuses to listen to anything. Um, you know, so, uh, and I think school leaders actually have to understand that because, you know, as, as, as educators, one of the things we try to do is we try to be accommodating. You know, we try to, you know, educate you know, regardless if it's our students, their parents, whatever. And we keep trying and keep trying until we feel we're successful. And I think we need, in that respect, at some point, we just sort of need to draw a line in the sand and say, okay, I'm, I'm giving up on this. This is the way it's going to be. Um, you know, I've explained to you why. Um, you know, you're free to disagree with me and, and that's fine. It tells me a lot more about you than it does about me and, and we're just gonna move forward. Actually, you probably shouldn't say the last bit, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, you know, and, and it's actually, I, I was sort of laughing to myself when you were doing the preamble to your question, because you talked about, you know, the, the, the culture shock and the differences that you had between California and Arizona. And I was thinking back to last week's seminar, uh, when we, um, one of the questions that folk, I think it was one of the panelists specifically asked that a lot of people, the panel asked, answered, and then was answering the question, you know, but when was the first time you had a black teacher? Actually, I think specifically it was when you had a first you know, black male teacher. And I grew up in, in Newfoundland, where 97.8% of the population is white. I had actually finished high school before I actually saw the first African American in real life. Um, you know, I mean, I had, to me, black people were on TV and in the movies until I finished high school from, you know, in terms of a, a person. So I can understand the culture shock type thing that you're talking about because, um, you know, I did my doc work in Georgia and rural Georgia at that. So uh, where we were in a minority majority uh, county. Um, so um, I think the other thing that, you know, when you're talking about looking at the community, and I think this is, Part of that idea of school leaders engaging with the community uh, has to think about and accommodate a lot of the cultural and geographic aspects of the community that they're working with. Um, you know, I mentioned this idea of remote learning, not just being online learning, but taking advantages of other mediums. One of those other mediums is the family setting itself. You know, there's a, a whole heck of a lot of science and math and for that matter, social studies that can be built into a lot of the things that people just naturally do in their homes. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I've got a colleague who does a lot of STEM work and she always talks about, you know, the science of cooking, you know, and all the different things that you can learn about, you know, directly from the science curriculum from cooking a meal, you know, and um, when you're starting to plan some of these things out, you know, if you're in a, uh, you know, if your school is serving an area where you've got a high proportion of students that, you know, have essential worker, single family type things, or both parents are essential workers. So, you know, that during the day, they're likely not going to be doing a lot of their uh, studies because they're just not in a setting that they can do those types of things in how do you incorporate other things from the curriculum during times when they can do things? You know, no one says that remote learning has to take place from 8.30 in the morning till three in the afternoon. Um, you know, and those schools that are trying to make that kind of model fit, I think, are ones that are setting themselves up for failure or setting themselves up to do a disservice to a certain population of students. You know, having regular check-ins at different points throughout the day, uh, and when I say throughout the day, I do mean, you know, throughout the day into the evening hours. I'm thinking of the day as, you know, not necessarily a 24-hour period, but, you know, at least a 12 to 14-hour period, 
you know, because there are going to be students that the only time that they can engage in the remote learning is, you know, from four o'clock till eight o'clock in the evening or four o'clock till nine o'clock in the evening. And, you know, that's something that school leaders through their teachers have to communicate and find out, you know, what's the, the community that you're serving. Um, again, looking at these cultural issues, uh, there are certain jurisdictions where you're going to find a lot more multi-generational households than what you find in other places. How can you work that into the curriculum? How can you incorporate that? Um, one of the, uh, there was a specific school that uh, uh, one of my colleagues and I were talking about in New Zealand where it was a rural school. It was primarily a Maori school, which is their, uh, their indigenous folks, their, their First Nations people. And um, they had a very, actually about 70% of the, the, the households were multi-generational households. And one of the things that the assistant principal, uh, what they would call deputy principal did, was they went through the entire um, elementary, well, for them, elementary school curriculum, year ones to year seven, and looked at all of the opportunities where you could meet a curricular outcome simply by getting the kids to talk to their grandparents. And then they would send, you know, the, the teachers, you know, okay, here's all the opportunities you can do this with. Um, and get you know try to engage your students into doing that and even the ones that weren't in multi-generational households a lot of them were able to call up you know nan or pop on the phone or you know on facetime or something like that and have those same conversations um you know and it wasn't relying upon technology and it was taking advantages of you know what the community had to offer for this particular jurisdiction what I really love about this conversation, and you know, you've said it in different ways, and what I how it comes together in my mind is this need to really inventory what are the resources and assets that we have, and how do we bring those to the forefront instead of kind of taking advantage of them. The notion of like using um, uh, physical school buildings as shared space for the people who who are most need of having access to that shared space. The idea of, of, of supporting families so that they can come together and almost in a co-op kind of nature share their own time uh, with each other. Um, the, the notion of just knowing like knowing your students enough to know like what is their family setting and, and do they have access to elders or community members that they can do like an interview if it's a social studies. Um, you know, John had even posted the question in, in the chat about what do we do, you know, when they have limited resources, you know, like do they even have a charger? It's one thing to give them a Chromebook. Do they have access to electricity? We have a big homeless population here in Vallejo. So how are we making sure that they have access to charge? And so libraries are, char are providing like charging stations for people. Um, but, but until and unless like we do a full inventory of all of those attributes and then make that information widely available and then collectively figure out how we provide, you know, responses in each of those settings, then we are still kind of just offering distance learning in its older, more kind of two dimensional iteration rather than what we can bring to a much more robust like remote experience. I'm glad you used the term inventory there, Louise, because it actually triggered something in my mind that I, a resource I wanted to share with folks. And it touches on a couple of the questions and comments that came up. So in, whoops, I just did that to all panelists. So that's my problem, sorry. Panelists and attendees. Um, so that's a link to a form that the, the State Department of Education here in California um, did. And they actually, uh, in a really sort of disappointing fashion, it wasn't until, or at least it never came across my desk until the end of July uh, in a tweet that the Department of Education sent out. And as best I can tell, that was the first time that they mentioned it. And I say it's disappointing because if you go and look at the, the, the survey, what they essentially are doing is they're trying to catalog what folks did in the spring in terms of what tools did they do, what kind of projects, you know, essentially how did they do their remote learning in the spring and what really worked well. And I, I'm disappointed that, you know, they're doing it at the end of July, because in my mind, as a school leader, this is what I would have been finding out at the end of May, you know, as school was getting ready to, to finish up, you know, finding out from my teachers, what tools were they using? How did it go? And, you know, did the students and, and faculty, did the students and teachers know how to use it? 
And from that, I can figure out, you know, what tools do we want to use going forward? Because I, I had a colleague that was over on the East Coast that, you know, another faculty member who was you know, working from home like we were, and she had three children one who was in grade three, one who was in grade five, one who was in grade eight, all in the same district, two of them in the same school. One of them for their discussion forums was using uh, Flipgrid. Actually, the youngest one was using Flipgrid, which is a video-based discussion. The middle one was using the, the grade five one was using the um, video-based discussion that was actually inherent in the learning management system that they had, which was Desire to Learn or Brightspace. And the, the one that was in grade eight was using voice threads, which is another video based discussion. So this is one school district that's using three different tools, all just for video based discussions. Right. And this kind of inventory that a school leader could take and really should take can figure out, OK, what are the tools that folks are using to do A, B and C? You know, what tool are we going to standardize for the coming year so that we can provide some sort of professional development for our teachers, both in terms of how to use it, but also how to use it for teaching? Because, you know, it's, it's one thing to be able to use a tool. It's another thing to be able to use it in an effective and efficient manner. And then how do we train our students to do it? You know, one of the, the things that you do find with most distance programs, regardless if they're targeted or not, is that when the student first starts learning at a distance, even if they've got all of the tools, all of the connectivity, it's a well-designed targeted type program, there tends to be a learning drop. Um, oftentimes it's about a five to 10% drop in student performance. And the main reason for that is because all of us here and all of our students that we have in the K-12 environment have had years of experience, years of practice, years of getting it wrong and right in terms of how to learn in a classroom. None of these people have, or very few of them, the scatter one that scatter secondary student that might have taken an online course in the past, but with the exception of those, you know, small percentage, uh, at best in the United States, it's about 5% of the students. The other 95% have had no experience learning online. You know, they don't know what it means to be successful and the types of things that they need to do to have success in the online environment. How to use these tools in a way for learning in the same way that in a face-to-face -face environment, you know, they, they understand how to read a textbook. You know, they know that the, the charts and the graphs usually convey most of the information. They know to look for the bolded terms in the, the paragraphs and stuff like that because they've been trained how to do that. They've learned how to do that. We've never provided that kind of orientation, if you will, for students. And, you know, so that's something else that school leaders need to do. In addition to get preparing the teachers to use these tools and how to teach with these tools, um, the first, I would say, week to two weeks of school shouldn't focus upon the content, should focus upon how do you learn effectively in this kind of environment. You know, obviously you're going to do some content along the way to help them, you know, provide examples for that, but we need to teach them how to learn in this, this setting. Um, and, and that's, a, you know, something that an inventory like that could do. Ijeoma, you look like you were getting ready to jump in there a second ago. Uh, no, but I do want to go back to um, another one of our, our comments. Uh, you know, I love to see that folks are uh, really, really chiming in. But uh, John talks about what could be done for students and families with limited resources. And I think this brings up a really important um, question that is near and dear to my heart. And that is the exacerbation of the achievement gap, opportunity and equity gaps that, that already existed prior to moving to distance learning um, and, and just really kind of expose a lot of the inequities that that are in our systems right now. So when it comes to to accessibility to internet, the technology that is required for remote, remote learning, and additionally, right, uh, the the loss of instructional value that really helped to contain the the gaps right uh how do we how do we address those issues 
Well, I, I think it's a, a multi-pronged approach. And some of the, the, the prongs I think we've already touched on a bit already. You know, trying to create, uh, to use Louise's word again, that inventory of the needs of our students and the willingness of parents to be accommodating for those that, you know, have greater needs than others. You know, so you're right. I mean, there are students that the only way that they're going to learn is if they're physically in a classroom not because the classroom is such a special and wonderful place, but that's the only place where they have the tools and the resources and the facilities to learn, both human and technical. Um, there are others that would have no problem learning at home by them, you know, with, with the, the overseer of a parent, oftentimes, you know, working in a, a non-essential position for a remote environment. And in many cases, those people tend to be folks that uh, are more educated than a lot of our essential workers tend to be. So those parents have a greater ability to support their students. Um, the idea of trying to, you know, really understanding the community that you're serving and trying to develop remote learning opportunities that aren't technology reliant. Um, you know, I mean, I like to think of myself as an educated person, but you know, I know little to nothing about that car that's you know sitting in my driveway that I, I use, well, that I used to use every day. Now that doesn't move for weeks at a time, um, you know. But there are folks that you know they could lift up the hood and tell me everything that's under there and what it does and how it works and what it would sound like if it's not working and those kinds of things and that's all important educational experiences that you know like i'm thinking like a physics class as an example or even just a you know a, a, a an elementary level social studies class where i'm looking at systems uh, which is you know a lot of what social studies looks like I'm trying to incorporate these everyday things into the learning experience instead of just making them technology based. Um, there are districts out there that would be able to do some of, you know, the provision of devices, um, particularly a lot of, you know, your urban districts where, um, you know, you're able to take those Wi-Fi enabled buses and park them in strategic locations that, you know, would provide Wi-Fi to certain communities where you're able to, um, uh, you know, provision iPads and Chromebooks and those kind of things and get them out into the hands of students. But there's some districts that that's just not going to work. Um, you know, one of my colleagues in, in Idaho um, is a great example. She, she works at the University of Idaho, but lives outside of town. Her nearest neighbor is eight miles away. They have three kids and eight miles in that direction. Her nearest neighbor in the opposite direction is five miles away who has two kids. There's no bus in the world that you could park somewhere in between those two that are going to hit both of those houses, you know, and those five kids along with um, my colleague aren't anywhere where there's internet service. She actually has to use satellite in order to access the internet. So she's the only one on her little rural road that has an internet connection. Everyone else just uses their phone when they're at home. You know, so those kids just won't have access to anything that is digital um, that's uh, uh, available to them. Um, now, in that kind of case, a lot of the curriculum you could actually load onto the computer beforehand. So you don't need to be online to access it. You know, a lot of that direct instruction, um, you know, and that might be 5% of your kids or 8% of your kids. Um, the same way with, I see a lot of schools and districts coming out with, you know, teachers have to have 90 minutes of contact with all of their students, you know, every day or three hours a week or something like that. To me, that, again, that kind of requirement, you know, is that equality aspect. It's not that equity aspect. You know, one student might only need an hour worth of their teacher's time, whereas another student might need six hours of their teacher's time. Why can't the teacher make those decisions as an instructional professional and then adjust how they're interacting with their students to, you know, provide what the student needs, not just some arbitrary number that's there. Even when we look at, you know, the nature of the, the curriculum, um, last year, depending upon, you know, where you were and what your school year looked like, you lost between 25 to maybe as much as 40% of the, the year. That means in theory, there's between 25% and 40% of the learning outcomes that my, you know, little 10 year old in grade five didn't get. Now they're turning 11 and going into grade six. 
And my grade six, her grade six teacher is expected to not just remediate the, you know, 20 or 30% that they lost last year, but teach 100% of this year's curriculum in a disrupted way. You know, I mean, the reality is somebody and, and state DOE should be doing this, but none of them have is looking at it and say, okay, what is in the grade five math curriculum that is necessary for students to be able to understand the grade six math curriculum and what standards are there simply because they were age appropriate and we thought a well-rounded citizen should know these things. Because teachers should be told, here are those critical standards needed for that curriculum continuity to the next grade level. Here's what you need to make sure your grade six class has learned so that they'll be ready for grade seven. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if that means we're only teaching 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the curriculum, that's okay. Because the goal is to get them what they need to be successful at the next level not to cover off some arbitrary number where some schools are going to get further along and those students will be advantaged, whereas other students won't be able to get as far along and they'll be further disadvantaged than what they already are. And if state DOEs aren't going to do this, districts or school leaders need to start doing this at their level. And in the absence of that, I mean, pointing to Ashanti's comment in the chat, you know, there are community organizations that can fill in some of those gaps, right, and provide some of those um, socially distant, remote um, locations for people to go to. Because even, I mean, remote learning doesn't necessarily mean like, right now it means in your house is remote, right? Mm -hmm. But what if you went to a different location where people were socially distant, where you could get some of the tools and resources that you need? Um, and then looping back to something you said earlier, just this notion of, you know, tools are not just all digital, right? Tools and resources are human beings. <clears throat> we have a lot to offer each other. And so how can we create, you know, even larger online communities where we're having this kind of conversation and sharing these ideas and then ideating and going, hey, what if we try this? <clears throat> and then kind of <clears throat> tucking in John's new comment about, you know, how can you get funding to really, because, you know, we have a lot of great ideas. So how do we put funding together? I think there are always lots of great community organizations. And I tell teachers in the classroom this all the time, like you have <clears throat> a need for a certain tool or, or some resource in the classroom. There are um, great service organizations like Rotary Kiwanis, you know, those kinds of places that wouldn't mind giving you anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand dollars, depending on who they are. Um, local realtors, especially if they're a realty consortia, usually have um, earmarked funds to provide to community support for education in particular, because we know education and real estate very closely tied when it comes to market pricing. Um, and, and yet, all of that takes me back to this question that Ijoma asked earlier, and that is, we now have additional, you know, newly introduced um, achievement gaps because of this. So as we move forward, and I realize we only have a few minutes left, but really thinking about forward down the road, what, what are our immediate, um, short-term, and then long-term kind of benchmarks or signposts that we can point ourselves to, to say, how are we helping to support, again, br bridging that new achievement gap that has, has popped up because of the fact that some districts went and kept, you know, introducing new content and other districts just did review for the, you know, during the spring of 2020. And so what does that mean? Because we're going to just only exacerbate that going into this new school year, if that's, if we continue to have that dis disparity, right? Yeah, um, well, to quickly go through it, the other thing that I would add to, you know, those opportunities for funding is for school leaders, particularly at the district level, to look at ideas of economies of scale. You know, while you might only have five grade, you know, five people in your science department in your high school, the district has 35 of them. You know, and as, uh, there's no need for you all to work in isolation and your district is next door to another district that's also in your county. Um, you know, so there's a, a real need for us to try to use this in a cooperative manner to get some economies of scale here so that we can decrease the, the amount of work that's involved with some of 
you know, these planning type things. Um, in terms of your specific question, I mean, the, the short term that I think, is, you know, the first thing I think is important in terms of addressing this inequity is figuring out what things are, are, are critical for students to have learned in the previous school year and what things are critical for them to have learned in this school year. Because if we lost a lot of time last year, if we're going to lose time this year because of you know closures or just the fact that we're not good at this yet or other disruptions that might come our way you know godzilla coming down or the murder hornets or whatever else is coming our or, you know towards us for those students that have historically been disadvantaged we don't need to waste their time on learning things that aren't critical for their ability to have success next year the year after the year after that if we can get to those things great but what are the critical outcomes that they need to master and let's focus upon those and if that means we're only focusing upon two-thirds of the curriculum that's perfectly fine you know, I mean, I can't think of the last time I used the quadratic equation from, you know, with the exception of when I was in grade 12 math, because I didn't do any when I went to university. Um, not saying that the quadratic equation is necessarily useless information, but I mean, when you look through the, um, well, I'll use when I was in at Wayne State in Michigan, there were 133 discrete standards in the grade 11 chemistry class. I'm sure 133, there's something in there that you can give up and still be an educated person. There's something in there that you could give up and still have success in the grade 12 chemistry class. You know, what are those that are there? Because if, you know, we waste students time on learning things that they don't have to know, it is really a waste of time. And unfortunately, as you noted, the students that have the least opportunity to, you know, make up the difference are the ones that are going to be most disadvantaged by that. Um, you know, so that's in my mind is, is just the first thing that, that everyone has to do, um, at, you know, all the school leaders have to do. And then the next thing is that inventory that we were talking about. Figuring out, you know, what are the specific needs of all of my students from, you know, what they have available to them and what they are missing um, and trying to cater an educational experience for them. And that's really going to look differently from on a student to student basis, both in terms of, you know, time in school, the types of activities that you're doing to cover the curriculum, the nature of the evaluation assessment that you're doing to cover that, the amount of interaction that you have with the teacher, you know, all of that is going to look very different. And noticing that we're only a few seconds from the bottom of the hour, I'm going to leave it there so uh, Egioma can remind folks about the uh, sessions we've got coming up uh, next week and following. Well, uh, Michael, I, I learned a lot. And, and as I stated when we first started, uh, you are a wealth of knowledge when it comes to uh, remote distance online learning. Uh, I, I look forward to your next session uh, where we can dive even deeper into pedagogical practices as it relates to this. Um, but yes, uh, we are continuing pressing forward with our Diversity Now series. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about equity uh, and equality, which I think is a good um, follow up to the conversation that we've been having today, right? Uh, Michael brought out uh, a few good points that I kind of took down. The number one being that access, accessibility is really important when it comes to remote distance learning. And so uh, next week, we're, we're going to be discussing equity and equality, and we promise to be talking about it through the scope of access. And so uh, we'll have um, Arnani Santos, who is the principal of Elite Public Schools, will have uh, Bell Reyes, who is the director of Innovation Bridge, and we'll have Britt Irby, who is the associate director of Innovation Bridge. And of course, we'll have myself and Louise will we'll be participating in this conversation next week. So please uh, join us as, as we continue this series, and I hope you all really enjoy the conversation that we had today. Of course, we're recording it 
So give us a couple of days and we'll have it online. If you missed last week's conversation, please go to our website, tu.edu uh, backward. Is that backwards or forward, forward slash diversity now? Um, and you'll be able to click on the link that will take you to the YouTube video of last week's conversation. Uh, Michael, Louise, you all have anything before we sign off? All right, another rousing success. We will see everyone next week.